Today is day one for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6. Monday, October 28th, 2024. Mormon 1. Help others share what they learn. When people share what they've learned, they strengthen their own faith and the faith of others. Try asking your family or class what experiences they had as they studied God's word. Having summarized accounts of the Lord's visit among the Nephites and the 200-year era of peace that followed, Mormon reported that starting in the 201st year, pride, disunity, and wickedness took over. In the Book of Mormon, we read of events where he was an eyewitness. These events include the demise of the Nephite civilization. Time after time through the centuries, the Lamanites, sometimes aided by dissenting Nephites, clashed with their Nephite brethren. And time after time, the Lamanites could not prevail for longer than a few years. Why? Certainly, it was not lack of manpower, for the Lamanites usually outnumbered the Nephites. It could not have been lack of military prowess or bravery, for the Lamanites seemed to have been able and courageous fighters. And even when the Nephites became so wicked that they destroyed their own social system and lapsed into such a state of anarchy that it was impossible to repel an organized foe, the Lord sent great destruction upon them but saved the more righteous part of the people to see the resurrected Christ. The only explanation for the continuing survival of Nephite society was the Lord's intervention because of their prayers and repentance. But then why, after all that time, did the Lord cease to intervene from about A.D. on? Why did he not only cease to intervene, but also to completely withdraw his spirit from both camps, leaving them to sink to depths of depravity without parallel in their history? The answer, of course, lies in their behavior. The Lord is always perfectly consistent. He doesn't save one group in spite of their wickedness and destroy another because of it. After the Nephites had enjoyed a Zion society for nearly 200 years, their return to weakness signaled total rebellion against the Lord. Gradually, the whole society turned to wickedness and the spirit began to withdraw. This time, there were not enough righteous people to save the society. As you study this period of Nephite history, watch for the signs of this final decay, for in it there are many clues of great value for us today. In Mormon 1-6, through we can empathize with Mormon sorrow over the destruction of his people, the destruction which came upon them because of their rejection of the Lord and his gospel. We can also resolve to avoid such calamity in our own lives. Mormon spared us the full account of the awful scene of wickedness and bloodshed that he saw among the Nephites. But what he did record in Mormon 1-6 through is enough to remind us how far people who were once righteous can fall. Amid such pervasive wickedness, no one can blame Mormon for becoming weary and even discouraged. Yet through all that he saw and experienced, he never lost his sense of God's great mercy and his conviction that repentance is the way to receive it. And although Mormon's own people rejected his pleading invitations to repent, he knew that he had a larger audience to persuade. Behold, he declared, I write unto all the ends of the earth. In other words, he wrote to you. And his message to you today is the same message that could have saved the Nephites in their day. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. These chapters repeat the message that prevails throughout the Book of Mormon. There is no weapon that can prevail against the righteous except their own unrighteousness. The Book of Mormon, Chapter 1 Amaron instructs Mormon concerning the sacred records. War commences between the Nephites and the Lamanites. The three Nephites are taken away. Wickedness, unbelief, sorceries, and witchcraft prevail. About 321 to 326 A.D. Amaron prepares Mormon to receive the sacred records. Because Mormon was quite young when he developed his faith in Christ, he can be an inspiration to your children. Perhaps you could read Mormon 1, 1 through 3, and your children could listen for how old Mormon was when Amaron gave him a special mission. You could also help them find in these verses the qualities that Amaron saw in Mormon. Mormon 1, 1. And now I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard, and call it the Book of Mormon. In an effort to correct an error in relation to the word Mormon, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote the following letter to the editor of the Times and Seasons, an early church publication. Sir, 
through the medium of your paper, I wish to correct an error among men that profess to be learned, liberal, and wise. And I do it the most cheerfully because I hope sober thinking and sound reasoning people will sooner listen to the voice of truth than to be led astray by the vain pretensions of the self-wise. The error I speak of is the definition of the word Mormon. It has been stated that this word was derived from the Greek word mormo, which is not the case. There was no Greek or Latin upon the plates from which I, through the grace of the Lord, translated the Book of Mormon. Let the language of the book speak for itself. On the 523rd page of the fourth edition, which is Mormon 9, 32 and 33, it reads, And now behold, we have written this record according to our knowledge in the characters which are called among us the Reformed Egyptian, being handed down and altered by us, according to our manner of speech. And if our plates had been sufficiently large, we would have written in Hebrew. But the Hebrew hath been altered by us also. And if we could have written in Hebrew, behold, ye would have had no imperfection in our record. But the Lord knoweth the things which we have written, and also that none other people knoweth the things which we have written, and also that none other people knoweth our language. Therefore he hath prepared means for the interpretation thereof. Here then the subject is put to silence, for none other people knoweth our language. Therefore the Lord, and not man, had to interpret. After the people were all dead, and as Paul said, the world by wisdom know not God. So the world by speculation are destitute of revelation. And as God in his superior wisdom has always given his saints, wherever he had any on the earth, the same spirit, and that spirit, as John says, is the true spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. I may safely say that the word Mormon stands independent of the wisdom and learning of this generation. The word Mormon means literally more good. In an overview of Mormon's life, President Gordon B. Hinckley referred to the meaning associated with Mormon's name, a name that has become a reference to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. May I remind you for a moment of the greatness and of the goodness of this man Mormon. He lived on the American continent in the fourth century after Christ. When Mormon was a boy of ten, the historian of the people, whose name was Amaron, described him as a sober child and quick to observe. Amaron gave him a charge that when he reached the age of 24, he was to take custody of the records of the generations who had preceded him. The years that followed Mormon's childhood were years of terrible bloodshed for his nation, the result of a long and vicious and terrible war between those who were called Nephites and those who were called Lamanites. Mormon later became the leader of the armies of the Nephites and witnessed the carnage of his people, making it plain to them that their repeated defeats came because they forsook the Lord and he in turn abandoned them. He wrote of our generation with words of warning and pleading, proclaiming with eloquence his testimony of the resurrected Christ. He warned of calamities to come if we should forsake the ways of the Lord as his own people had done, knowing that his own life would soon be brought to an end. As his enemies hunted the survivors, he pleaded for our generation to walk with faith, hope, and charity, declaring charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever, and whoso is found possessed of it in the last day, it shall be well with him. Such was the goodness, the strength, the power, the faith, the prophetic heart of the prophet leader Mormon. By the time he was only about ten years old, Mormon was remarkably different from the people around him. As you read Mormon 1-6, through look for ways that Mormon's faith in Jesus Christ made him unique and gave him opportunities to serve and bless others. The following verses might get you started. Mormon 1, 2. And about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came unto me, I being about ten years of age. And I began to be learned somewhat after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amaron said unto me, I perceive that thou art a sober child, and art quick to observe. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said, When we are quick to observe, we promptly look or notice and obey. Both of these fundamental elements, looking and obeying, are essential to being quick to observe, and the Prophet Mormon is an impressive example of this gift in action. Mormon 1.3 Therefore, when ye are about twenty and four years old, I would that ye should remember the things that ye have observed concerning this people. And when ye are of that age, go to the land Antum, unto a hill that shall be called Shim, and there have I deposited unto the Lord all the sacred engravings concerning this people. 
How do these qualities help us follow Jesus Christ? Because Mormon followed Jesus Christ, he was given opportunities to serve and bless others. Mormon 1, 4-7 And behold, ye shall take the plates of Nephi unto yourself, and the remainder shall ye leave in the place where they are. And ye shall engrave on the plates of Nephi all the things that ye have observed concerning this people. And I, Mormon, being a descendant of Nephi, and my father's name was Mormon, I remembered the things which Amaron commanded me. And it came to pass that I, being eleven years old, was carried by my father into the land southward, even to the land of Zarahemla. The whole face of the land had become covered with buildings, and the people were as numerous almost as it were the sand of the sea. Bloodshed among the warring Nephites and Lamanites. Mormon 1, 8-12 And it came to pass, in this year there began to be a war between the Nephites, who consisted of the Nephites and the Jacobites and the Josephites and the Zoramites, and this war was between the Nephites and the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites. Now the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites were called Lamanites, and the two parties were Nephites and Lamanites. And it came to pass that the war began to be among them in the borders of Zarahemla, by the waters of Sidon. And it came to pass that the Nephites had gathered together a great number of men, even to exceed the number of thirty thousand. And it came to pass that they did have in this same year a number of battles, in which the Nephites did beat the Lamanites and did slay many of them. And it came to pass that the Lamanites withdrew their design, and there was peace settled in the land, and peace did remain for the space of about four years, that there was no bloodshed. Spiritual darkness results from Nephite wickedness. Mormon 1, 13-14 But wickedness did prevail upon the face of the whole land, insomuch that the Lord did take away his beloved disciples, and the work of miracles and of healing did cease because of the iniquity of the people. And there were no gifts from the Lord. And the Holy Ghost did not come upon any because of their wickedness and unbelief. In detailing the commencement of the wars that led to the downfall of the Nephite nation, what did Mormon write about the spiritual condition of the Nephites and Lamanites? Moroni 7. Have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men? Or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them? If these things have ceased... Woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. Then has faith ceased also, and awful is the state of man. Elder Erastus Snow said, If our spirits are inclined to be stiff and refractory, and we desire continually the gratification of our own will, to the extent that this feeling prevails in us, the Spirit of the Lord is held at a distance from us, or in other words, the Father withholds His Spirit from us in proportion as we desire the gratification of our own will. The prophet Joseph Smith said, Have not the pride, high-mindedness, and unbelief of the Gentiles provoked the Holy One of Israel to withdraw his Holy Spirit from them, and sent forth his judgments to scourge them for their wickedness? This is certainly the case. The Lord declared to his servants some eighteen months since the church was organized that he was then withdrawing his Spirit from the earth. And we can see that such is the fact. For not only the churches are dwindling away, but there are no conversions, or but very few. And this is not all. The governments of the earth are thrown into confusion and division, and destruction to the eye of the spiritual beholder seems to be written by the finger of an invisible hand in large capitals upon almost everything we behold. Mormon 1.15 And I, being fifteen years of age, and being somewhat of a sober mind, Therefore, I was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard, and call it the Book of Mormon. Now, both the people of Nephi and the Lamanites had become exceedingly wicked, one like unto another. Get out of the way, boy! And Amaron, who kept...
kept the record of the people of Nephi being constrained by the Holy Ghost, did hide up the records unto the Lord, that they might come again unto the remnant of the house of Jacob. I, being about ten years of age, began to be learned somewhat after the manner of my people. I come again unto the... Mormon, Amron is here to see you. I perceive that thou art a sober child quick to observe. When ye are about twenty and four years old, go to the land Antum, unto a hill that shall be called Shim. And there I have deposited unto the Lord all the sacred engravings concerning this people. Ye shall take the plates of Nephi and engrave all the things that ye have observed. And I, Mormon, remembered the things which Amaron commanded me. My beloved Lord. And when I was fifteen years of age, and being somewhat of a sober mind, I was visited of the Lord, and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. What do you think it means to be of a sober mind? Sober can mean reverent, serious, or thoughtful. Read the following statement by President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We have watched patterns of reverence and irreverence in the church. While many are to be highly commended, we are drifting. We have reason to be deeply concerned. Irreverence suits the purpose of the adversary by obstructing the delicate channel of revelation in both mind and spirit. Mormon writes in his record the following brief statement concerning one of the greatest events in his life, being 15 years of age and being somewhat of a sober mind. Therefore, I was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. This statement indicates that he was evidently the recipient of a personal visitation by the Savior. Though Mormon gives us no clue that his parents were righteous, we do know that he grew up in a time of great wickedness in his society. Yet he remained pure enough that as a youth, he could receive a visitation from the Savior. Such an example should inspire present youth who also must live in times of great wickedness, but who can rise above it, even at an early age. Mormon 116, And I did endeavor to preach unto this people, but my mouth was shut, and I was forbidden that I should preach unto them. For behold, they had willfully rebelled against their God and the beloved disciples were taken away out of the land because of their iniquity. Many evils followed in the wake of evil choices. When people reach a certain level of wickedness and are determined to reject his living prophets, God does not allow the prophets to minister to the people. In modern times, the Lord suggested that if his people were faithful, he would bless them with commandments. Often in our foolishness, we think commandments are a burden rather than a blessing. Yet, through the commandments, we are shown the only way to joy and peace. To have a great prophet in their midst, and yet have the Lord not follow him, to bless them by giving them commandments, was a great tragedy for the Nephites. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles contrasted the spiritual maturity of Mormon with the sinful state of Mormon's people. In spite of Mormon's righteous desire, he was forbidden to preach because of the rebellious condition of his people. The maturing Mormon, by then 15 years of age, stood beyond the sinfulness around him and rose above the despair of his time. Consequently, he was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus, trying valiantly to preach to his people. But as God occasionally does when those with so much light reject it, Mormon literally had his mouth shut. 
He was forbidden to preach to a nation that had willfully rebelled against their God. These people have rejected the miracles and messages delivered them by the three translated Nephite disciples, who had now also been silenced in their ministry and been taken from the nation to whom they had been sent. While serving as a member of the Seventy, Elder Dean L. Larson explained that rebellion against God has individual roots which, if not corrected, spread with devastating consequences. Historically, the drifting away from the course of life marked out by the Lord has occurred as individuals begin to make compromises with the Lord's standard. This is particularly true when the transgression is willful and no repentance occurs. Remember Mormon's description of those who turned away from the true path in his day. They did not sin in ignorance. They willfully rebelled against God. It did not occur as a universal movement, but began as individual members of the church knowingly began to make compromises with the Lord's standard. They sought justification for their diversions in the knowledge that others were compromising as well. Those who willfully sin soon seek to establish a standard of their own, with which they can feel more comfortable, and which justifies their misconduct. They also seek the association of those who are willing to drift with them along this path of self-delusion. As the number of drifting individuals increases, their influence becomes more powerful. It might be described as the great and spacious building syndrome. The drifting is the more dangerous when its adherents continue to overtly identify with and participate with the group that conforms with the Lord's way. Values and standards that were once clear become clouded and uncertain. The norm of behavior begins to reflect this beclouding of true principles. Conduct that would once have caused revulsion and alarm now becomes somewhat commonplace. Mormon 117. But I did remain with them, but I was forbidden to preach unto them because of the hardness of their hearts, and because of the hardness of their hearts, the land was cursed for their sake. While there are no miracles among the people as a whole during this time, there were righteous individuals, Mormon being one. This suggests that no environment can become so corrupt that a private individual cannot have the sweet influence of the Holy Ghost. Yet, this divine influence could not benefit those around Mormon because of the hardness of their hearts. What differences do you notice between Mormon and his people? What qualities did he have that helped him stay spiritually strong in such a difficult time? President Russell M. Nelson taught, True disciples of Jesus Christ are willing to stand out, speak up, and be different from the people of the world. They are undaunted, devoted, and courageous. There is nothing easy or automatic about becoming such powerful disciples. Our focus must be riveted on the Savior and His gospel. It is mentally rigorous to strive to look unto Him in every thought. But when we do, our doubts and fears flee. Mormon 1, 18-19, And these Gadianton robbers who were among the Lamanites did infest the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof began to hide up their treasures in the earth, and they became slippery, because the Lord had cursed the land, that they could not hold them, nor retain them again. And it came to pass that there were sorceries, and witchcrafts, and magics, and the power of the evil one was wrought upon all the face of the land, even unto the fulfilling of all the words of Abinadi, and also Samuel the Lamanite. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency warned against intrigue with Satan's mysteries. It is not good practice to become intrigued by Satan and his mysteries. No good can come from getting close to evil. Like playing with fire, it is too easy to get burned. The only safe course is to keep well distance from him and any of his wicked activities or nefarious practices. The mischief of devil worship, sorcery, casting spells, witchcraft, voodooism, black magic, and all other forms of demonism should be avoided like the plague. <laughs>